songs like what we are singing today, these choruses coming up to that last one, they they really, if we think about it, they really speak to our journey. If you were not walking with the Lord and you came into a church like this and we were singing these songs, you would st stand there and say, I don't even know how to sing them. What do they mean? And they wouldn't connect with where you were because you have not discovered Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Or if on that journey, things happen in your life and it, and it broke you, it hurt you. And you feel so broken and you feel so lost and you feel so cut out. It's like, I feel like I'm cut out of God's will. I think I'm cut out of his purpose. And you try to sing a song like, he knows my name. Because he's my friend. Because I am your own. And that morning you don't feel like you're his friend. You don't feel that morning like you are his own. I want to share with you from Mark chapter 7, a journey that is to be unexpected, an unexpected journey for two individuals whose lives are really messed up. And there's no hope in their life whatsoever. Their journey has brought them to a very lonely place for each of them. I thought about this in the in really what direction I go in this Lord. And the one the one phrase that keeps coming to mind, and I know somebody's gonna laugh, I just know it. But the one phrase that keeps coming to my mind is the land of misfit toys. Now, now who knows where that comes from? There's a few of us, yeah. Come on, we can admit it. We watch Christmas cartoons. Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, and there are the misfit toys. And why are there misfit toys? Because the toys do not do what they're supposed to do. So you have a tree, a choo-choo train with square wheels. It's a misfit toy. You have a doll that cries but doesn't laugh. You have, the, you have a misfit toy. You have all kinds of uh, these stuffed animals and toys that are supposed to do things and they don't do them and that's why they get rejected and they get sent to an island all to themselves because you're misfits. You don't fit in. You don't belong. The two people we're looking at here in Mark 7, they're misfits. According to society, they don't belong. They don't fit. And the journey is taking them to a place of isolation a journey to loneliness, a journey to despair. Their journey is, is going to one of these unending nightmares that will not go away. You know what? Jesus loves. He loves to encounter misfit toys. He loves to come and encounter with a person who feels like they have no place in life. He longs to come and just take a moment and sit with someone who feels so alienated and so isolated from the world that they feel like nobody understands and nobody cares and nobody wants and, and I'm all by myself and oh God, why? And Jesus said, for this day I have come to answer that why and to change you from what you think is unproductive to turn you into a productive woman of God in one case and a productive man of God in another. Mark chapter 7, verses 24 through 35. And I, I'm going to read through about third, verse 30, and then it, that's the first, that's the first one, and that's the, the woman, and then on through 35, the man. So Jesus left that place and went to a vicinity in Tyre. He answered a house and did not want anyone to know it, yet he could not keep his presence secret. In fact, as soon as she heard him, a woman whose little daughter was possessed by an impure spirit came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek born in Syrian Phoenicia. She begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. 
First, let the children eat all they want, he told her, for it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Lord, she replied, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And then he told her, for such a reply, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. And she went home and found her child lying on the bed and the demon gone. Then there's a next encounter. Because he leaves this area. He leaves the vicinity of Tyre and went through Sidon down to the Sea of Galilee and into the region of the Decapolis. And there some people brought to him a man who was deaf and could hardly talk. And they begged Jesus to place his hand on him. And after he took him aside, away from the crowd, Jesus put his fingers into the man's ears. Then he spit and touched the man's tongue. We want to start practicing this in healing services. He spit and touched the man's tongue. He looked up to heaven and with a deep sigh said to him, Epha fatha, I know I just messed that up, which means be opened. At this, the man's ears were opened. His tongue was loosened. And he began to speak plainly. Amen. Lord Jesus, would you help us, Lord? Would you help us, Lord? To appreciate what you're doing here and how this really speaks to us and applies to us that we may take your word to our world. Lord, in the name of Jesus. Oh, amen. Amen. These encounters begin with Jesus. Jesus is on his own journey. At this point, he is still towards the beginning of his ministry journey. His journey has brought him to the, the outer banks, to the outer fringe of where the Jews lived. And so he comes out to, to this place in the vicinity of Tyre. The house that he enters He's now in a region that is mostly Gentile. So he has left the region of, of, of all Jewish vicinity, Jewish region, Jewish um, homes, Jewish villages. And now he has entered into essentially a Gentile village. And the home that he's entered into, the woman is a, is a Greek who has been raised in this place in Tyre and Phoenicia. What's important to understand about Tyre and Phoenicia and Jesus' journey is that he has gone to the edge and walked into a home occupied by a woman who was born in that region and raised in that region and raised her daughter thus far in that region. She and, and her daughter live in a region occupied by the Canaanites, who have been a very long time enemy of Israel. There's no love lost between the Canaanites and the Israelites. So Jesus has just entered into enemy territory in more than one way, Moses, because he has entered the territory of a, of a known enemy between two tribes. But he's also entered a spiritual enemy's domain. Am I right? Because what's he, what is he going to encounter in that house? He's going to encounter demonic spirit. So he has gone into the enemy's camp not once but twice, not in one way, but in both ways, both in tribal and in spiritual. Uh, sometimes we have a hard time ministering when we can't get past the tribal. And we miss what God is doing in the spiritual. We get so caught up about the tribal. Oh, I'm not going to go minister to them. I'm not going to go pray for them. Oh, not those people. They're, they're the wrong tribe. They're, they're, they're not us. I don't want to touch them. They're unclean. Let them all go to hell. That's where, they, that's where they deserve. I hope none of you ever say that about a human being. I hope you never let those words come off of your lips. 
because one of the most simplistic verses that people consider so simplistic and say, oh, here we go again. John 3, 16, John 3, 15 through 17. That God so loved the world. So God's never going to look at the member of a human race and say, I'll save them, but not you. I want you, but not you. Jesus covers your sins, but not your sins. Because in the human race, when we're not careful as the human race, that is exactly what we do sometimes. We look at the human race and say that the blood of Christ covers you, but not you. Anybody can be saved except you. Jesus makes a, and he makes a point to go into a house. Not only does, you know, the, the scholars look at this and say, Jesus is trying to get away from the crowd and he just wants to go and find a quiet place to sleep or rest. He's in. Jesus knows everywhere he's going. And he knows who he's going to, in, in, he knows who he's going to contact. He knows who he's going to encounter uh, long before we ever get to see him. Jesus said to, about Zacchaeus, I saw you when you were up in that tree. I knew you before you ever saw me. I already knew you. He already knew that his friend was dead, Lazarus, when he said to his friends, Lazarus is dead. I want you to know this because we're going to go raise him up. So long before they ever get to the tomb, he already knows what's going on. He already knows the circumstance. He already knows when he's been ministering to the crowd and he says to his disciples, let's get in the boat and go across the lake. He already knew that there was a gathering. There was someone in the gatherings over there that had how many demons? A legion. He already knew that he was going to leave a place of ministry that was tiring him out physically to go across the lake to do a ministry that was going to be so supernatural and so super powerful. He was going to cast out a legion of demons. He knew where he was going and he knew what was going to go on. When he got to Jerusalem on the hilltop, he said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who have killed the prophets, how I long to gather you as a mother hen would gather her chicks, which you would not. And now because you would not accept me, it is all being hidden from you. The truth of who I am is being hidden. A cloud is coming over your eyes, over your mind, over your soul. So when I walk back into this city, you're not going to want to appreciate me. You're not going to want to receive me. You're going to want to kill me. He told his disciples, I'm going back to Jerusalem to die. There were no surprises. So I look at this encounter where he leaves from the fam, from the doing with doing the family business, all the disciples and doing the ministry. And he leaves to go into this house and he's trying to get alone. He wants to be alone. I believe he wants to be alone because he doesn't want to bring the disciples into this encounter. He's leaving the, the disciples out of this encounter. This is between him and this woman. There are a couple of things here to consider. This is a woman who is by, by nature, by tribe, an enemy of God. And with, with his disciples here, one of the things that they're going to stumble over is why is he touching a Greek woman? Why is he ministering to a Gentile? Horrible! You think Jesus has just a little ounce of, dis of discernment? Can I get an amen in the house? You think maybe Jesus has a little bit of discernment? Shouldn't we have some discernment when we walk out and go into a place of ministry? Shouldn't we discern? Shouldn't we ask God, help me to see, help me to understand, help me to interpret, help me to discern so that I can be so that as effective as I can be as a man of God, as a woman of God, and whatever God is calling me to, wherever he is sending me. We ask God, please bring somebody into my life to witness to and talk to. We need to ask God, whoever you're bringing into my life, give me some discernment. Do I know how to minister to them? Don't just give me the tools to go out and do it. Give me some wisdom and some, some, some supernatural discernment so that when I use, Lord, your tools, when I preach your word, when I pray in the spirit, when I want to operate in the gifts of the spirit and move by your power, not only do I want to see your power displayed, I want discernment to know who I'm ministering to, how I'm ministering to them. What is the most effective way to do this? Sometimes you can do more damage than good. If you try to minister without discernment, you can cause more harm and you can cause more pain if you do not operate with discernment. You need discernment. Jesus is teaching here. 
the importance of discernment. He knows exactly what's going on in that house. He already knew he was going to go in and meet a woman. And not only does he know who he's going to encounter, this woman finds out that Jesus is there. It's a Greek woman living in a Canaanite village. And she finds out that Jesus has just crossed over into their area. And he's coming into her house. He already knows who Jesus is. Sarah, they don't need an introduction. I don't see an introduction here. I don't see anybody coming in and say, excuse me, this is Jesus. He ministers among the Jews. But he's here tonight. What do you need? There's no introduction here. He walks into the house, and what does this woman do? A woman who has been alienated. Do you know what it means to be a Greek woman with a woman, with a girl, with a daughter who is possessed by a demon? She's an outcast. She's not allowed to be in society. Like the woman at the well, because she's had so many different husbands, and the man she's with now is not her husband. And that's why she's there in the middle of the afternoon to get water, because she can't be there with the other women, because they've ostracized her. This woman, this Phoenician woman with a, with a daughter who has got a demon in her, she is alone. She's very alone in the world. She's isolated from her society. They don't want her. That's why I say she's a misfit toy. She's in the land of the unwanted. Her journey has taken her to a deserted place, to a place where nobody wants her, nobody loves her, nobody really cares about her. And she said, what do I do? And she finds out that Jesus just entered. And she already knows of Jesus' reputation. And what does this woman do? She falls at the feet of Jesus. And she begs Jesus. Heal my daughter. Heal my daughter. And then comes the interaction that some of you have read over and 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 over. And, over, and you still want to know what does that mean? When Jesus basically says, I have no food for you. I don't have any food for you. To translate, he's telling her, Israel still has more to eat. And there's no food for the Gentiles. That's what that means. I'm still feeding Israel. And it's not your time yet. Gentiles were considered dogs. That's how they were, that's how they were looked at. That's a, that's a euphemism that they used for Gentiles. Jews used that for Gentiles in that day. They are the dogs. So there's no food here. We're not feeding the dogs yet. This woman is not, she is not taken. She is not, she does not seem to respond with an offense to Jesus. How does she respond? Classic. What does she say to Jesus when Jesus says, it's not time to feed the dogs. I'm still feeding the people. It's not time for the Gentiles. What's her answer? It's beautiful. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall off the table. Surely, Jesus, there's something for us. Surely, Jesus, you have something don't you have any leftovers? Isn't there something left over from what you've been doing? Jesus, you've been out there ministering to the crowds. You're coming in here. You're tired. You're looking for a quiet place to rest. Isn't there some leftovers? Don't you have anything? A woman who is alienated, she's isolated. She's unliked. She's unwanted. She's a misfit toy. Begging Jesus for a few crumbs. And Jesus looks at her response and says, basically, to, 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 again, to translate, he basically looks at her and says, well played. Well played. He looks at her and says, I admire your faith. I admire your tenacity. I admire that you're not willing to give up. I admire that you look to me and you, and you see that there is something for you. 
and you're not stopping until I until I respond. You're not stopping until I give you what you're asking for. Like the woman who won't stop praying, and the ju- and and the, and the judge says, says, "I'm going to give you what you want, so you stop bothering me." He's not quite there with this woman, but Jesus, that's Jesus looking at her and saying, "You got guts, lady. You got guts." And for that kind of tenacity, for that kind of faith, woman. Go back to your daughter. There is no demon. She's been healed. And she goes back and she finds her daughter sleeping. And her daughter is completely at rest. And there's no demon. Jesus comes into our world. No matter how lonely and despair we think our world is. No matter how rejected we think we are by mankind. No matter what we think we have done in this world. Jesus knows you. He knows all about you. He knows everything you have gone through. He knows every lie. He knows all your fears. He knows every problem, every trouble, every unclean thought, impure thought, every action. There is nothing you can hide from Jesus ever, ever, ever. Can is there an amen? you cannot hide anything from him you cannot hide anything from God and yet God looks at us and says even though you cannot hide any of your dirt I love you so much that I sent my son to die on a cross for you I didn't send it because you earned it I sent it because I love you you may be the greatest misfit toy in all the village but I'm still coming after you I'm still seeking you You look at Jesus' ministry, he has a reputation for looking out and seeking out all the misfits in the villages. Who does he go after? He goes after the blind who are on the street begging because they're misfits. They don't don't fit in society anymore. So they put them on the street, beg for your food, buddy. Who does he go for? He goes for the people that society has no use for. Troubled people who have no other hope in their life. And that's who Jesus goes to as an example, as a light, as a witness to the whole rest of society. This is who I am. Jesus said, I came to seek and to save those who are lost. It is not the healthy who need a doctor. It is the sick. I have come for the sick. I have come for the lonely. I have come for the broken. Do you ever feel so broken in your life? Do you ever feel so hurt in your life that you feel like you're completely alone and abandoned in this world? I want you to understand, no matter what you have been through, no matter what you're walking through, no matter what you're living through, there is no such thing as being totally abandoned from Jesus. You can feel completely abandoned by this world, abandoned by your country, abandoned by your family, abandoned by your friends, abandoned by your, co- and you can just go on with the list. Abandoned by your dog. Even the dog runs away. That's a country song, by the way. When the dog runs away, just play it backwards. They all come back home. No matter how abandoned you feel, you are never abandoned by Jesus. Jesus knows all about your struggles. He will prove who he is till the day is done. As that hymn says, there is not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. He knows my name. And I am his own. And I am his friend. Because Jesus is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. If he's my friend, and sir, you're his friend. If he's my friend, then I'm his friend. We're co-heirs with Christ. This relationship's mutual. We got a friend in Jesus. And that means Jesus looks at you and says, you're my friend. Don't let the world dictate who you are. Don't let the world define you. You're not defined by the world. If you have things in the world where people don't want to know you, they don't want to be around you, they don't want to associate with you, Jesus is still associating with you. 
Now that's good. But remember that in this world, there are still people who don't have the peace of God that you and I have. They don't have the relationship that you and I have. And they're out there and they're feeling totally alienated. They feel totally maligned. They feel totally alone in this world. And they feel like nobody cares. They feel the church has forgotten them, that everybody has forgotten them. And we have to get out there and remind them that we have not, that God has not, that Jesus still loves them. And we cannot pick and choose and say, this group deserves my time, and this group does not deserve my time. God's going to send you after somebody, and when he sends you, you go. You don't look at them and define whether or not they're worthy of your presence. Because if God tells you to go, they're worthy not only of your presence to minister to them, they're worthy of Jesus Christ coming down and, and healing them and setting them free and delivering them and saving their soul. Come on, you know this is good. Jesus goes out to the outer edge into a world that, that he himself says, they're not ready for this because I haven't, I haven't died on the cross yet. I'm still here for Israel. And Israel is going to reject me. And they're going to put me on a cross. And I'm going to die for their sins, but not just for theirs, but for the whole world. And after I rise from the dead, I will send out my church. And when I send out my church, I'm not going to tell them to stay in Israel. I'm going to send them out to the entire world. Go to the far reaches, every continent, every planet, everywhere on this planet where there is a human being. Tell them about Jesus. Aren't you glad, Praveen? They came to India and told you about Jesus. Come on. You guys are glad they came to Italy, told people about Jesus. They went to the DR. They went to Puerto Rico. They went to Israel. They started from Israel. They've gone back to Israel. And they're telling the world about Jesus. So the first encounter begins with Jesus encounters a woman whose journey takes her to a very what she thinks is a bitter end only where she can see that she gets life all over again the second one is this deaf and mute man in the second part of this text there's something very similar that happens here again discernment Are we operating in discernment? Jesus goes, he leaves the vicinity of Tyre, goes through Sidon, down to the Sea of Galilee, and into a region called the Decapolis. And there, the storyline is a little different, because here, there's a crowd that's following him, and he's ministering, and they're, they're with him everywhere he's going. And it says, some of the people brought to him a man who was deaf and could hardly talk. So we would say deaf and mute, deaf and dumb. And they begged Jesus to place his hand on them. They weren't specific enough. They should have just said, lay hands on them, Jesus. They said, put a hand on them. And said, Jesus said, I'll put a hand on them. Finger in each ear. Unusual. But before Jesus does the unusual healing ministry that he does here, what does he do first? What does he do first? He prays. Now, what does he do first? He takes him aside. He removes him from the crowd. He's doing one-on-one -on -one ministry. When we do healing ministry, when we minister to people, we don't always have to be in the center of a crowd hoping that there's 50 people, 100 people, 3,000 people watching us. Watch what I do. No, watch what Jesus does, really. Jesus has got the crowd with him. He doesn't bring him around and said, okay, guys, watch what I do now. He takes this man and he pulls him aside so that it's just him and that man. One-on-one -on -one ministry. Ministry does not always have to be a show. Ministry may very well be God may call you and say, go to somebody alone. Go to somebody in private and talk to them and pray with them and minister to them. 
He took this man outside. There was nothing embarrassing about taking him. There wasn't anything like the, like the woman at the well. There was a lot of embarrassing conversation to have there with her. You've had many wives, woman, um, many, many wives. That, that's, that would be today. You had many husbands. And the one you're with now is not. So you are rightly said. And that would be a conversation to have one-on-one -on -one with somebody. And not with a microphone with 1,500 people listening. If somebody came down and said they wanted prayer, they started talking to me about something that seemed very personal. You know what the first thing that I do is? I shut this bad boy off. Because if I don't shut this off, whatever you're sharing with me, everybody in the room is being brought into your conversation. So I shut this off because this is between you and God. It's between you and God. And so if you're talking to me about something you want prayer for, and it seems like it's, it's personal, I shut it off because nobody else needs to know. It's you and Jesus. It's you and Jesus. It's you and Jesus. Sometimes God wants, he does things right out in the wide open. And there are other times he takes them aside. And I believe the difference is a discerning spirit that Jesus operates in. He knows what he's doing. He knows who he's dealing with. This man is another example of someone who is an un, a, a misfit toy, someone unfit to be able to live as normal in a society. He doesn't fit in society. He's one of those that would be put out by the side of the road with a pan and somehow made to understand because he's deaf. And he says he can hardly speak, so there's very limited communication. But he would be made to understand, you, sit, you lie here on the, on the dirt, or you sit here in the dirt with your little pan. And people walk by, they'll throw a few pennies in the pan. Whatever you get from that, which we would say today, panhandling, whatever you get, that's what you're going to buy your bread with. And so your meal today would be whatever size bread those pennies can buy. You're not going to sit down to a, a bowl of stew. You're not going to sit down to some other kinds of beans and fruit or vegetables and a, a nice meal like somebody else would sit around in their, in their little home with. You're going to have a piece of bread. And you better be lucky that it's a piece of bread that will keep you from starving for the next three hours. There's not a lot of mercy. There's not a lot of empathy. There's no care for people who fit, this, who fit this description of this man who was deaf and dumb, or as we see in other cases, people who are blind, they can't see, people, a woman with an issue of blood that's, that's down on the floor and dragging along and trying to reach the robe of Jesus, and she snuck in because she's another misfit toy that has been kind of kept away from society because she has an issue that nobody wants to, she's unclean. When you're going through your menstrual cycle, you're unclean in the best of times. In your healthiest time, you're unclean and you've got to stay away. Well, this woman's been doing this for seven years without, a, without an end to her cycle. She has been grossly alienated from her world. And sneaking in because she believes so strongly that Jesus can heal her. The people in this crowd feel so strongly that Jesus can heal this man who is deaf and dumb. They do something that is so beyond anything normal for them. They actually take a misfit toy, bring him in and say, Jesus, you can make him fit again. Jesus can heal. Do you believe Jesus can heal? There is no plan B for this man. There is no social security safety net for him. When you get to this place, unless you're part of a very wealthy family, even your family disowns you and puts you on the street because they cannot take care of you. They don't want to take care of you. You're too much work. Let the, let the community feel sorry for you. Jesus takes him aside with one-on-one -on -one ministry. And yes, he practices some very unusual methods. It's the only time that you will see that Jesus will put his fingers in someone's ears. It is not the only time that you will see Jesus spitting. This time he spits, basically he spits into his fingers and then takes his fingers with the spit and puts it on the man's tongue. 
with what we've been through for the last couple of years, you'd be running so fast. Like, don't come near me. <laughs> but there's another example of someone who's blind. And what does Jesus do there with his spit? He spits into the ground, doesn't he? And he takes that, that now little bit of mud and he mixes that spit in that dirt. And he takes that like a salve and he puts it on the man's eyes. And he tells the man, now go wash your eyes. Go wash your eyes out. And when he did go wash his eyes out, what happened to his blind eyes? All right, so let me ask you, is the spit what heals him? Twice he uses spit. Is it the spit that heals him? Is it the dirt that heals him? There's one case where Jesus is praying for someone who's blind and he prays for him. He says, what do you see? The guy says, I see, I see men, they look like trees. Well, it's not a complete healing, is it? So Jesus prays again. Was Jesus losing his touch? Was he having a bad day? There are all kinds of different experiences that you see played out in the Gospels of Jesus' ministry. The bottom line is not the method. Don't get lost in the method. Get into the reality of a spiritual warfare going on. Get into it. This is Jesus healing. It's his healing ministry. It's not about the method. It is about the power of God that is moving in him and moving through him. Don't get lost in methods. Get in touch with the power. And we've had all kinds of movements go on in the world, go on across this country. You know, when they had some of these things going on in Toronto a number of years ago, there are people who went out there, they came back, they went right into their churches, and they tried to copy what they saw in the, in, in the meetings up in Toronto. And, and guess what? No big surprise. It all fell apart, and it went crazy. And, there, and instead of having something good happen, it, it became horrible. People became divided. People began fighting each other. Churches began splitting. When, when you go off to a revival and you experience something phenomenal from God, do what they did in the Bible. And they hide, they, they treasured in their heart. You go before God and you seek the face of God. Of oh, God, what did I see? What did I experience? What were you doing there? God, how can I see this in my church? You come back to your church not trying to repeat what you saw. You come back to your church saying, God, I want this fire in my church. I want this power in my church. God, I want, I'm asking you to move in my church. I experienced this. This is real. It changed me. It transformed me. It did something marvelous in me. God, I want to see that in my church. And God may hear you, and God may answer your cry, and God may move supernaturally in the church, but it may not look like the other one that you were at because God has unique moves for his people because there's that word that I'm going to use again. God has discernment. He looks at Carla. He loves you, Carla. You know that. Come on. He looks at Carla or Rick or, or, or Kim. He looks, at, he looks at us. He knows us. He knows everything about Cindy and Ed or Laura. He knows all about Moses and Moses. The Moses and Moses. And he even knows which one is which. God doesn't say Moses and Moses G. He just says, I... You, Moses. No, you, Moses. God knows us. He knows my name. So he knows what we need. He knows where we're at. He knows what we're ready for. He knows what will, will challenge us. He knows what will send us over the edge if not careful. God is. God loves us. He is so careful. He sees us as his precious children. He wants wonderful and powerful things to happen in our lives and move through our lives but it will be unique to what God wants to do with us. And there are a lot of similarities that will flow in, in church revivals. And it will see, Mike, well, it's the same thing they're doing over at Bethel, or it's the same thing they're doing at what used to be Apple Valley, or it's the same thing they're doing over at Crossroads, where, where my home church. But yet there's going to be unique nuances that God is doing in a church because it is not about an organization. It is not about a denomination. It is about people. It's about people. Remember, for those of you that have been around here for 30 years, do you remember, you know, like anybody has 
was here 30 years ago, or Dixie was here, uh, that you know, we, had, we had one very bizarre, to me it was bizarre, and I've shared this before, and I'll keep saying it again, that, that with, with Sue Dupre, when I'm standing up here ministering, and all of a sudden my left ear is on fire, my ear is burning, it's like, it was like it was on fire, and without even thinking about it, I just said out loud, my ear is on fire, somebody's being healed with your ear, you have a problem with your ear, and the moment I said that, the moment I said that, the instant I said that, my ears stopped burning. And when my ears stopped burning, I then said, whoever you are, God just healed you. And a woman looked at me, her, her eyes got big, her mouth opened real wide and said, that's me. And she stood up and I said, what did he do for you? And she said that she had an ocean in her ear. Of course, she had a punctured eardrum and she had an ocean in her ear. And she'd had that for a number of years. And, and she said, it stopped. The ocean isn't there anymore. It doesn't, it's not ringing. It's not ocean anymore. And I said, go see your doctor this week. Now there are some faith people, faith healers quote, who say, don't go see your doctor. You have no faith. No, go see your doctor. Let the doctor see what Jesus did. If Jesus healed you and you go see your doctor, God's not taking your healing from you. If he healed you, he healed you. Go show the world. Go to the doctor. Don't go with arrogance. Don't go showing off. Just go, doctor. I just want to do a follow-up. You check my ear? Let the doctor discover that your ear is healed because that's what she did. She went and saw her doctor and said, I just wanted you to check my ear. Not only did God heal her of the ringing in the, in the ocean in her ear, which the doctor caused, by the way. The doctor punctured her eardrum and God healed it. The reason the doctor punctured her eardrum was she had a very rare disease and she was being treated for it. And in the process of being treated, the doctor punctured by mistake her eardrum. The same doctor looked at her ear. The eardrum is whole. He tested her and told her that week that she no longer had the disease. You see, that morning, God didn't just heal the symptom. He healed he didn't just make the, the noise go away. He healed. She was whole that day. Now, I'm, I, I know I've said it before. Some say, oh, he's telling that story again. I, I, I just want you to understand, we did not start a burning ear ministry. We, we did not start doing training on Tuesday nights to train people how to get their ears to burn. You see, I'm not making fun. I'm trying to help you understand. God does what he does. And sometimes what God does is very unique and it's unusual. That doesn't mean God's saying, I want you to start a burning ear ministry. Now get, you know, get down with me and learn how to have your ear burn. And then go all over the world and heal burning, heal people's ears. And you're going to, every time you have your ear burn, somebody else is, well, being healed. Now, God may do anything he wants, and God may very well set you up and prepare you to go out and do a unique ministry. And I'm not even taking that away. I'm just saying God has discernment. And sometimes God does really interesting things that are so off the chart that they, it doesn't make sense. Because I look at this healing, it doesn't make sense to put your fingers in somebody's ears and to spit on your, on your hands and then put it on a man's tongue. And the natural, that does not make sense to me. And Drew would run so fast. On so many levels. Because it's, it's so different, which is why he's been taken aside. But the end result is he's healed. The result is another person damaged by, by the world and its perception of him, forcing him to take a journey of isolation, a journey of hopelessness, a journey of no future, but to, to sit on the road and beg for pennies. And God said, your journey, your journey on the road begging stops. And I have a new journey for you. In your new journey, you will hear and your new journey, you will speak. You will be just as productive in society as the rest of the people in your society. No longer do you sit on the road begging. Now you're going to have a new direction for your life. 
God saves people. He doesn't just save them to fill heaven with more people. He saves them to transform them, to renew their minds, to prepare them for who knows what God has in store for them. That's what the concept of journey is so important because every single one of you are on a journey. And you're on a journey that should be leading you, directing you towards heaven. But your journey has a lot of stops and goes and curves and changes, speeding up on a highway, slowing down on a side road. Your journey is very varied and, and has all kinds of nuances, all kinds of different life experiences. But in that journey, Jesus Christ is with you every single step of the way, not every mile, every step. And you need to trust him on your journey. And be careful about comparing your journey with somebody else's. Your journey is yours. Your journey is yours. Your journey is yours. He knows your name. Can you trust him? Can you trust him? Can you trust Jesus? I'm not asking you to say, Jesus, bring it on me. I'll take a spit any day. I'm asking you to do to you trust Jesus. Do you trust him? The Bible says, lean not in your own understanding, but in all your ways, acknowledge him. Acknowledge Jesus. Why? Because he will direct your path. Acknowledge him. He will direct your path. Let Jesus direct you. Let him lead you. I pray that he will, he will give you a discerning spirit like you have never had in your life. To do ministry like you've never thought possible. To be effective in touching people's lives. I, I'm, I'm Part of me wanted to really preach this particular message because we are, we are at a different place in our country, in our society than we've ever been in our entire life in the entire history of this country. And the changes going on in our country that are not comfortable, they just aren't. And some of the changes that are going on in the country are, there are splitting people, are dividing people. And the more it splits and divides us, the more we're gonna be in his and her camps. And the more we are in his and hers, us and them, the less you're gonna have any desire to minister to the them. Be careful, God may raise you up to minister to the thems in your life. God may very well choose you to go minister to somebody that in the natural you wouldn't want to be within 10 miles. Just not your cup of tea. And God would say, I'm not asking you to drink tea. I'm asking you to go minister to them. Go pray for them. Go love them. There's a reason you haven't seen them outside their door in five weeks. Go bring them a hot meal. Knock on the door. Just tell them you love them from Jesus. And here's a hot meal. You have no idea what's going on in that. You do not know. Have some discernment. Wait on the face of God. Let God minister to you so that you can minister to the thems. We have to overcome the us and them in this country because there's a lot of souls that need to be reached for Jesus. And I'm not saying you've got to change your, your feelings or your views on life. You've got to, you've got to, you have got to, we have to um, not give in to that whole thought process of us and them. Because if we don't give, if we give in, we will not minister to the thems. And there are a lot of thems that Jesus loves. He loves them all. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name.